Welcome. We're just letting people into the from the waiting room. We're letting them in and we'll get going in a, just a few minutes. Well, good afternoon, everyone, or good evening, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, I don't think there's anyone we need to say good morning to, but if there is, good morning. My name is Wayne Addison. I'm a long, long friend of, longtime friend of Rosemary's dating back to our undergraduate university days. Thanks for, for being here, for, for coming to the, this online book launch of Rosemary's book, The Art of Losing It. I'd first like to touch on a, just a, a, a few um, housekeeping issues before we get going. In the top right hand corner of your screen, there's an icon that says view. Uh, we ask that you uh, select and remain on speaker view. While you're doing that, I'd like to say that if there are, are any technical glitches, and there can be, and somehow you get lost from the meeting, if you simply go back to the to the link that Rosemary sent you and click on it, uh, you, you will be let back into the meeting. Uh, afterwards, Rosemary is going, uh, going to do a few readings. And afterwards, uh, we're going to open up the chat room um, where you can ask questions. For those of you who don't know, that's if you take your, your mouse to the bottom of the, the screen, a chat icon will, will pop up. If you just click on that, you can put your questions into the, into the chat box. And lastly, we're acutely aware that, that um, this isn't the only thing going on in the world. There's a US presidential debate that's less than an hour away now. So we're, we, we will end this meeting at, or this, this launch at, at 5.45. And, and we'll try and answer all the questions that we can. If we can't, if, we, if there are still questions that you want answered, you all have Rosemary's email address and you can email her directly. And Rosemary, being the wordsmith she is, will get right back to you. It's got a little pop up here. Now, a little bit about Rosemary. She, first off, Rosemary has her master's degree in journalism. She's an accomplished survivor of many things that life was throwing at her. An avid and enthusiastic sports participant. She's also a, a crazy fitness nut who swum more lengths in a pool than anybody I know or more than anyone could count, probably. She was previously an online uh, on-screen news reporter for CFTO TV in Toronto, which is part of the CTV network. She had her own uh, radio show in Vancouver, uh, creatively named the Rosemary Keeble Show on CFUN Radio, which is part of the Chum Network. She was managing editor of Scarlet Magazine, which is a, an online, or not an online, a magazine for women in Canada. And I guess I've known Rosemary for so long, I can even remember when she was a can can gang dancer at Diamond Gertie's in the Yukon. She's fun, she's enthusiastic, sometimes a little too inquisitive, um, and definitely purposeful. And she brings a lot of talents to the table. And all of these talents have resulted in a great read. So we're now going to turn it over to Rosemary, who's going to do a few readings for you, and then she'll take your questions later. Rosemary? Thanks, Wayne. Um, that was a very, very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, as Wayne said, uh, we are longtime friends, and um, he's also a, um, a he's a very um, a frustrated performer, Wayne. <laughs> and he has a starring role in the book. And can I tell them your alias, Wayne? You sure can. Yes, I've disguised people so well in the book, especially Wayne, who I call Dwayne. 
<laughs> the little scene in the book with Dwayne, which was supposed to be funny, so I hope that it was. So I'd like to thank Wayne. I'd like to thank Rebecca Wood Barrett, who did um, a lot of the tech at the uh, Worcester Writers Festival, which came off beautifully. She did a beautiful job, and she's today doing the uh, pushing the buttons for for us here. And so I've nicknamed her Techie Becky. And I'd also like to thank She Writes Press, uh, the stellar team there, and their fearless leader, Brooke Warner, who's been with this project for um, quite a few years now. So a little bit a skeletal version of my story. When I was 36 years old um, in 1991, and my brother was 41, and my husband was 41, my brother got diagnosed with uh, AIDS, which was a death sentence in those days, and my husband got diagnosed with terminal cancer, and the kids were three and five. The men died in, within about um, a year, just over a year, and um, so grief and um, loss and all that was inundated with crises, and then grief and loss for me and the kids, and um, Unresolved grief can lead to chronic conditions such as anxiety and depression and addiction, and I ended up being guilty of all of the above. I held it together somewhat for about six years, somewhat, and then I um, got got in the grips of alcoholism and addiction for six years, and it was what one would call <laughs> a high-functioning uh, addict and alcoholic, which is kind of a little bit scary when you when you think that my behavior would be someone who was high functioning it basically meant I could I could still work and uh, then in 2002 I went into rehab and I've been clean and sober ever since uh, and still a work in progress it's one day at a time um, so I lost my husband I lost my brother I lost myself I perfected the art of losing it I did not lose my life which can happen with addiction and alcohol, alcoholism. So I'm one of the lucky ones. Um, I've learned along the way, um, fair bit, I'm still learning, but um, a big thing was, or is, that the only way past it is through it. And that's, um, that is with both grief and addiction. With grief, one needs to actually grieve. And um, our society is not necessarily that great at um, having, having to deal with grief. Um, for other people's grief or our own, but anyway, I and I didn't really grieve till I was sober. But um, one needs to process as you can give give one's time, give one time, and uh, um, give it, give a bit of attention. Uh, it's, you're allowed to be sad, and with addiction, absolutely, the only way past it is through it. It's important imperative to find out um, why I was numbing myself and what other issues would uh, trigger uh, drinking and using. So I can get into that a bit more, but I just wanted to put out there what I, I've learned and that I hope, it's my hope, the book could, could be a resource for people and provide hope that you can live through this, the suffering of grief and addiction and be okay. <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still working at it, but I'm okay. I'm certainly more okay than I was. So, um, I'm going to read uh, some passages from the book. Part one is about, um, about loss and grief, and part two is about uh, addiction and uh, rehab, and then my first year of sobriety, so recovery. And uh, before I get into these passages, I'm going to um, show you this book, um, which is a diary that um, Barry left me. Of, of his last couple months of his life. And then he writes a few things. And one of them is about the house I'm in. So when he was sick, we were building this house at Worcester that I'm in right now. And I would take samples to the ho hospital of carpet and uh, tiles and um, door handles, doorknobs, <laughs> really important things. But it gave us kind of like a forward focus. And um, it was a, a good healthy focus. And fortunately, Barry got to see the house finished. And he did write in the diary um, when he was here one weekend, this place will always remain a special pride to me and one that I hope Rosemary and the kids 
enjoy for a long, long time. So as I said, this, this diary, it turned out to be an incredible gift. Um, he writes at the beginning of it, which he started in July of 1991, uh, July 27th, and he died September 22nd. So it stops at the end of August. So obviously he ran out of energy, but he says with what little energy he has, maybe he shouldn't be devoting it to, um, he was sorting out files, banking files and pictures and photos. And he was, uh, he, he was saying, well, maybe with the little energy you have, um, Rosemary would be more appreciative of something else rather than organized files. Uh, maybe if I wrote down my thoughts and feelings, it would be more interesting than my 1986 car insurance. So, and as it turns out, it reads like a love story. And my first reading is going to be about that. So, uh, I think all we need to know here is that Pixie is two and a half years old. One evening when I'm having trouble settling Dixie and all I want to do is sleep myself, I decide to leave Dixie crying for a bit and hope she will calm down on her own. I'm headed down the hall to her bedroom when I hear Barry call out in pain. I rush into the room, he's in bed, lying on one side but propping himself up with his right elbow so he has a direct sight line to the door. When he sees me, he says, Honey, I'm dying. I rush over and sit beside him. You really are in so much pain, aren't you? How can I help? Can you lie all the way down? No, it hurts to move, he says. My head is screaming and I can't sleep. What can I do? Shall I get some more painkillers? If I run you a bath, could you sit in it? Would it help? I don't know, I don't know. I just took some tramadol. He gingerly starts to move onto his back and I help to lower him. Oh, he says, that's a bit better. My head isn't screaming as much. It's settled to a dull roar. Maybe a bath will help. Thanks so much, sweetie, I love you. He tells me, I'm glad you're on my team. You are my life. So now you can see why it was a gift and why it's a love story and um, why I'm one of the lucky ones who's had a soulmate in my life. So many of us go through life with a soulmate, but I, I've had one. So um, that highlights that the agony that we were going through, as well as um, the, the, it was this, he was everything was a crisis. <laughs> it was a crisis that he couldn't sleep. But then there were big crises. I uh, going back, from, I had to run from hospital to hospital and back to the kids. We were at home being needy, and um, I I wanted to take a passage out of the book, which explains and it illustrates how um, hectic that was to be guiding two men to their deaths. And um, the only thing we need to know about this passage is that Rob is in Vancouver General Hospital in this. Um, so where are we going? Okay. The next day, Barry and I head out to the hospital in Bellingham for his MRI. It happens that Vancouver General is on the way to the border. So I asked Barry if we can stop at BGH so I can give Rob a quick smoke break. He politely agrees. I arrive to do my duty and Rob is duly grateful as we head back out to the smokers area. I strain to make congenial conversation with the other six smokers and even with Rob who knows that Barry is waiting in the car for me so we can go to Bellingham for yet another medical test. I keep a watchful eye on Rod's cigarette as it burns towards the filter. Each puff makes the glowing ember creep closer and closer to my release. When it looks like there is no more tobacco and Rob is about to smoke the filter, he takes one last lingering puff, relishing the hot nicotine as it rushes down his throat, through his windpipe, and to the farthest recesses of his lungs. As he stubs up the butt, I eagerly make a motion to leave and he lights up another. Oh dear. <laughs> uh, so I was going from crisis to crisis and um, 
I was one doc, one of the doctors, I saw many, many doctors um, explained to me that I was going through crisis management, which really resonated with me is exactly what it felt like. And later on, somebody said it was, I was suffering post traumatic stress syndrome. Um, I would have breakdowns. I, I remember um, one crisis when uh, Barry was in the hospital, he was in Lionsgate Hospital, he'd just been admitted again, and he was in a room with three other um, sick men, not just sick men in the hospital, but they were, <laughs> they were, they were barfing and coughing, <laughs> diarrhea. Uh, it, and Barry looks at me with this really desperate, desperate look. And I know he wants to get his private room. So I'm on a mission to go get a private room. And I go by the elevator and there's a phone there, which is like gold in those days, a pay phone. I call, decide to call my sister in Toronto I ask her what she's doing, and she says um, that she's having a dinner party. And well, this just triggered me she, because it was so normal. And I just was, would love to do something normal. I think she felt badly, but she had no reason to feel badly. <laughs> she was just telling me what she was doing. Um, but I started to have a breakdown there, and then I realized I need to wait. I need to time my breakdowns. So um, I just filed it, and then at bedtime, I had my breakdown. So. This is how I, I juggled the, the crises. I just, you know, you just end up in survival mode. Um, there's one last reading in part one, speaking of crises. And uh, this is when, um, and then there's just two more after that part two. Um, I, I, I know you're kind of saying, oh, there's so many readings. Well, I'm gonna justify it. They're, they're, <laughs> they're short. Uh, anyway, um, this reading uh, is when Barry is at home and he's not well, he's so not well that he has to be taken to the hospital, hospital by ambulance. I can't take him because he's too sick. I think he's going to have um, a, uh, a biopsy on his brain. So uh, Willow is five and Dixie is two. I lie beside Barry on the bed as we wait for the ambulance. No, that's wrong. I started in the wrong place. <laughs> I was distracted by the dog and I realized I should have done something with the dog. Anyway, um, Willow and Dixie are looking out the front window as the ambulance pulls onto the driveway, mesmerized by the big white and red vehicle with a red light on top, which is not flashing, that has come to take their daddy away. My motherly instincts make me desperately want to shelter them from all of this, but I can't. I can't cushion them from this harsh reality. I watch them watch the ambulance attendants readying the gurney. I see two little girls grappling with a tangle of new emotions, and I know that their innocence will shield them for only so long. This is something none of us can escape from, and it will leave an indelible mark on our souls. It's almost as difficult watching them flounder as it is watching my husband die. What must this be like for their little two-year-old and five-year-old minds and hearts? What are they thinking? As if she hears my ponderings, Willow looks up, and up at me and says, is daddy going to die today? And what do you do with that? Um, I did, I, I did do some uh, research for how to grieve for us and the girls and um, I, I'm not saying <laughs> I, I, I did it all by any means I, I tried to learn what to do I was at Deathy's bookstore and I bought so many books on death and grieving that the checkout woman asked me if I worked in the palliative care unit <laughs> but with the kids the main thing was getting their uh, their feelings out and talking to their people who they spent time with like their teachers and um, family members and let them know that the, the kids need to talk about it. They need to talk about the, the, the loved one who's died and that they, at different ages, they process uh, death and finality differently. A three-year-old apparently doesn't have um, as much of an understanding of uh, finality as a five-year-old would. And I remember Dixie would just tell complete strangers that she was, um, that her father had died and we were in the 
checkout counter, and actually, no, we were in the, um, beside the beans in the supermarket, and uh, there's a woman beside us, a stranger, complete stranger shopping, and Dixie looks up at her and says, it's my birthday and my daddy's dead, dead, dead. Oh, the poor woman. And meanwhile, uh, Willow, who's five, asks me who she can tell who's, that her daddy's died. So it just gives them a good example of um, the difference of how they would process it. And that means we're all still processing it. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's definitely a work in progress. Uh, so that's the last reading from part one. I have two more. Um, and I like to keep, hopefully they're short. I know people have places to go, things to watch. Um, and it is, um, part two, as I said, is about addiction and my time in rehab and one year of, of my uh, first year of sobriety. Uh, this first reading happens just after I've hit my bottom and I'm desperate. I, I know I can't drink and uh, drug again. And I don't know how I'm going to do that. And a friend of mine is talking about her spiritual counselor. And I thought, um, well, maybe I should try a spiritual counselor. I wasn't even sure what it was. I thought, well, couldn't hurt. So this is um, me meeting with the spiritual counselor. Okay. Her name is Sheena. She talks gently. Her words emerging slowly from her like thick cream the kind you get at high tea with scones and strawberry preserves. She has a reassuring half smile that does not expose her teeth. She's older than my 47 years, but ages really. She wears flat, round toed sensible black shoes and a single string of white pearls. Her hair, brown with hints of gray, is pulled back from her face in a bun. She has luminous blue eyes that seem to peer right into my soul. I feel exposed but protected at the same time. On the wall behind Sheena is a three-dimensional hanging of Jesus on the cross. The bookshelf is lined with titles like The Book of Common Prayer, The Book of Blessings, and Choose Love. I say, I drank a lot of wine, took a couple of sleeping pills, and drove the kids. My kids, my girls, they're only 13, 15. I did $4,000 worth of damage to the clutch in the car. I pause and shake my head and let the tears gush out as I finish my confession. I almost lost the family dog and I blacked out at the wheel. It's a miracle I didn't have an accident. Then I got a letter from the police that I was seen driving erratically. I'm wondering, well, I pause and wonder exactly what am I wondering? I get up my nerve and finish my thought. Do you think I need a spiritual retreat? Keeping her eyes on mine, Sheena rolls her chair closer so she's about three feet from me. I have squeezed myself into the corner of what feels like the proverbial psychiatrist's couch. Rosemary, what about rehab? She says. Imagine my surprise. Are you surprised? I was surprised. <laughs> How could I possibly be surprised? Uh, a bit of a no-brainer. So um, I, I did actually uh, take her advice and uh, did some research and figured out where to go. And within a couple of weeks, I was in uh, rehab for 28 days. And um, that has stuck with me um, one day at a time, but I've been clean and sober since May 3rd, 2002. And um, uh, the rehab was really very difficult. Actually, so was the first year of, of sobriety. Um, but the next reading is, happens in rehab. And it uh, shows me working through, through it. And the only way past it is through it. I'm working through some, um, some wreckage that I have. Uh, this past, to get through it, I have to get through all the, uh, understand all the dysfunctional coping mechanisms, all the reasons I drank, all the ways I avoid um, being intimate and all the ways that um, it's all the clutter, got to deal with all the clutter in the head, the detritus and make, make some room for, clean it out, <laughs> shine a light on all the, all the skeletons and really face them and dust them off and make amends to people who I harmed. And my biggest amends was a living amends to my children to live as a sober mom. But it was important to make some room for grace. Um, so there's room to grow and improve and, and I'm a work in progress. Um, so this in this reading, 
I'm at the rehab center and uh, Graham is the facilitator of our group therapy and uh, Celia and Darlene are both inmates, which we called each other and the other clients in the rehab center, we called each other inmates. Good morning group, Graham starts the session with his usual salutation. Then he walks over to the whiteboard and writes, the problem is not the problem, the problem is coping with the problem. He reads his words aloud and continues, today we are going into our wall of defenses, those behaviors that keep you from being intimate and genuine. Rosemary, why don't you give it a go? You said you finished this assignment, right? Graham nods for me to come to the board and holds out the marker. So then I go and I write some things on the board, which I discovered um, were my bricks in my wall of defenses. And I continue reading here. As I look at my growing wall of defenses, humor, sarcasm, running, swimming, sensitivity, shock, shock, shopping, I'm shocked by how at ease I am with all these people, once complete strangers, exposing my dysfunctional coping mechanism. It's like giving birth. All is so exposed, there's nothing else left to be apprehensive about. What about making yourself too busy to stop and think about anything, let alone feelings, Celia asks. I think I do, yes, I guilty as charged, I interrupt her, thinking about all the stuff I cram into a day, blaming it on being bored easily. Maybe I just don't want any spare time because that would mean being in my own head. I've heard people in the AA program call the noise in their head the committee of assholes. I'm getting a pretty fortified brick wall here, I say. Yes, that's the point, Graham says. Anything else? Sex, darling ass. Sex, I'm surprised. I'm not addicted to sex. Yes, but to use it, do you use it to mask feelings, Graham asks. I think about this. Well, there was this one Greek fellow I called up between relationships. That was a distraction, I guess a way of coping with emotions I didn't want to deal with. That's exactly right. I had, I had too busy and sex to the list. That looks like a pretty sturdy brick wall of defense, as Graham says, and gestures for me to take a seat. So there you have it, a lot of me. <laughs> a lot of me working through, working through things so that I can uh, get past them. And uh, it, that's not the end of it by any means. Um, it, 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 the work continues, but um, there certainly was a lot of work done in those first few years of sobriety um, that one can um, work through it and get past it. Uh, both grief and addiction, um, you can get through the suffering and um, I'm living proof that you can do that, I'm okay. And if you are suffering from any of these conditions or loved ones are, um, they can be okay, they can get through it. And it's my hope that the book will act like that a type of resource um, for people. And um, I hope that it's a good read. And uh, I think um, we, you can get the book at, on Amazon and Armchair Books has it at um, Whistler. And if you have any other questions after the uh, session today, feel free to email me with uh, questions or comments. And I'd like to thank you all very, very much. Again, I feel like I've got great support from everybody. I have the wonderful feedback and I really appreciate it. And I appreciate Wayne being here. Thanks. Thanks, Rosemary. That's, that's great. You, well, first I should say um, you're open for questions. So if anybody has some questions, they can put them in the chat box, which again is at the bottom of the screen. If you check, uh, click on the chat icon, uh, you, can, you can type in your question and uh, we'll try and get through a few if we can. One thing, while well, people do that, Rosemary, and you said it, uh, oddly enough, you've never, I haven't heard it before, but you, you kinda, you kinda brought up a couple of times, the only way past it is, the only way past it is through it, you, you, you said a couple of times. Is that the takeaway? That's the big takeaway. Um... The other big one is something that happens before that, and that is acceptance. Acceptance is huge, both with grief and with um, with addiction. With grief, one has to really accept that that grieving is exhausting, and one needs rest and uh, self care. And people need to understand if they they know someone who's lost somebody 
that um, it takes time. And our culture is great in that we deal with, um, with everything within the first couple of weeks of the funeral. But after that, the person is still suffering. And um, when you lose a loved one, there's, you get a hole in your soul. Time helps. It, when the hole will never go away, but time uh, helps to uh, soften the edges of the, of the hole a little bit. So ex acceptance is important with grief and acceptance is important with um, addiction. I had to accept what a bad mother I had been. I was consumed by guilt. I was consumed by shame. Uh, and that never leaves. I've always had that guilt and shame, but I had to go to acceptance um, so that I wasn't um, nagged by these, these really negative, negative emotions. And um, so once I went to acceptance, actually there was some freedom in that. Okay, it's what I do now that matters. That what the next right thing is what I need to do. So I had a lot of, a um, lot to, to work through, but I had to accept, first of all, what I had done and I had to accept the fact that, that it's a lot of work to, to get through everything that <laughs> I had to get through. There's so much work, it's not done yet. So anyway, thanks for that question, Wayne. That's important. We have a question here from, I can't read it, Jill, I believe. It says, was writing the book more ther therapeutic Pudic or terribly difficult. It's just moved on me. <laughs> Was writing the book therapeutic or difficult? As you, find, as you find yourself reliving so very many emotional experiences that felt again raw. Well, I was a bit removed from the experiences when I was writing it, but I was I did actually help the grieving process definitely helped the grieving process it was definitely therapeutic and um it, it was difficult to write about the behavior as of uh, uh as as a mother's behavior that it was as shameful as it was but what's interesting is recently i um when the book came out i um read it again when it was hard copy well when it was um yeah hard copy and I, what I found was I, I was getting sad again. It was, it's, I mean, it's still therapeutic and I'm still uncomfortable with my behavior in my addiction. So uh, yes, it's, it was all of the above. It was, um, it, the feelings came back and it was therapeutic. Terry Sue, Terry Sue writes, <clears throat> clearly you have been through the ringer but I hear a strong sense of humor in you. Can you tell us about that, the gallows humor? Oh dear. <laughs> How does it keep you? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what to say about a sense of humor. However, we, as we heard in the reading, apparently humor can also be a, um, um, one of your defenses when things are getting too intimate or uh, too honest. Um, I can use humor to deflect. So um, it's just something that I'm aware of, but um, I, I love to laugh. And um, I, sometimes I have, a, my laugh is a little bit loud. I've known to be scare babies with my laugh, but <laughs> I'm not too sure what else to say about a sense of humor that it can, it can actually work against me sometimes. So, I mean, you talk a lot about yourself. What about the kids? How did you get them through all of this? How did you deal with all that? Well, as I said before, when with the grieving, I tried to do some homework to figure out how to help them through. Um, they've been very, very resilient. Um, uh, a big issue was when I got sober, you'd think that once I was clean and sober, everything would be absolutely great. But God, I was throwing a wrench in what was what the family systems theory calls it. We were in, in when I was in my addiction, we were working in a dysfunctional equilibrium. It doesn't mean that everything's smooth, things are chaotic, but within the chaos, the family members are acting, the behavior is predictable. And all of a sudden, my behavior is unpredictable. I have curfews, imagine that. And, um, and I, I, have, I have rules and, and one 
one um, said one said, kid said to me at one point, I just wish you didn't get sober because all of a sudden I was being a difficult mother. So uh, I, the kids have been through the ringer too. I've been through the ringer, but the kids have been through the ringer. They've been very, very resilient. So it hasn't been easy for them, but they're doing okay, absolutely. Well, I mean, the, the debauchery must have been the norm. So becoming sober must have been a like a real paradigm change for, for everyone around you, not just you. So uh, what did you say? What's the norm? Was the norm? Well, like like, like uh, drinking and, and, yeah. and drug addicted. And then all of a sudden you became sober and everything changed. What was that like? Well, it was um, incredibly hard. We were just the first year was very, very, very chaotic. And um, we, I, I mean, it's, I, there are scenes in the book where I, I have the curfew and, and the re rebelling against the curfew. Well, no wonder they were rebelling against the curfew. Or I didn't have curfews before. I didn't have any rules before. Um, and when we were in, uh, when we went to, went to family rehab, um, actually, one of them actually admitted to me that she thought that her friend's mom cared more about her friend than I cared about my daughter because the friend's mom had rules and I didn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. There's a, two people here have actually written that they'd rather listen to you than the two guys that are about to come on TV. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I almost... Oh, when I, I picked the date, I didn't know it was the date of the um, president's debate. And I thought, oh no, I have to change the date of my launch. I can't be up against that. And then I found out that the debate starts at six. And so, okay, I'll just be a really cool warm up act. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a question from Cynthia in Vancouver that says, I have read in books about grief that the person grieving needs to be asked in social situations instead of how are you, how are you today? Was that helpful to you in social situations and what's, what was supportive in terms of friends? Uh, well, as I said, our society doesn't have a, um, a healthy way of dealing with, with uh, we don't learn how to grieve and we don't learn how to help other people grieve. I think if someone said to me, how are you today would be better than how are you? People don't know what to say. Um, uh, one neighbor across the street after Barry had died, we ran into her, she didn't know what to say. She was so uncomfortable. She said her, she started talking about her dog who had just died. I, mean, I felt sorry for the woman. I mean, because <laughs> yeah. you don't know, we don't learn what to say. Um, but how are you today is probably better than most things. Um, and to remember that, the feelings can be raw for quite a long time. And it's usually the person who loses somebody, they get a lot of attention within the worst first month and, or, or, or few months. Um, I thank you, Nancy from down the street. She gave me casserole and Cynthia gave me Montreal bagels. I'll never forget all this stuff. Uh, but then it stops coming. Right. Cool. Right. And does that end abruptly or does it just... It's Peter's out. Yeah. Yeah, Peter's out. And the one thing I know this knowing you, the timeline that, 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 that you went through, it wasn't like you went from this to that. There was a, a long extended period of time, was, right? It was years and years, like kind of long time until you actually came out the other end. Well, yes, um, they died in 91. And it, as I said, I held it together somewhat for six years and then I fell apart for six years. And then I got sober and I didn't really start grieving until I was working through my issues. So that was 11 years later. So here's a question. Here, here's a question. When, when did you have the idea to write the book? When, when did that come to you? When, when now you I've been trying to figure that out. <laughs> I think, I think I was never not going to write the book. It was, but it must have been, uh, obviously, I didn't write it till I got sober, but uh, it had it has had various versions over the year, over the years in uh, the first version was in 2007. 
when I wrote, I went to a Muskoka novel writing marathon and I wrote the book in that weekend um, and it was 50 pages. So, and then the next version was in 2011 when I did my thesis at UBC at the School of Journalism. And it, the thesis was, um, half of it was academic about addiction and the other half was part memoir. So then a few years after that, I got down to um, brass tacks and, and, um, and started writing it with a, with a content editor, with Brooke Warner, who I mentioned at the beginning. So that took about a year or so. So I, yeah. I, I didn't have all of a sudden say, I'm going to write a book about this. I'm a journalist, so I write. That's what I do. So um, I think it was always there. Nice. Well, it's we're getting we're getting close to the end. So so and and most of the comments and there's there's a lot of them are all congratulatory to you. Some people have read the book. They love the book. Uh, everybody's uh, admiring your courage and, and and the way that your you, even your laugh has been defined as contagious. So oh, good. Uh, congratulations. Um, for those of you who haven't read the book, every chapter is titled by a song. And as I as I read it, I was, and, and I, as I read it, I was reminded of John Lennon, who said, "Life's what happens when you're busy making other plans." And this this book is really what happened when Rosemary was making other plans. I knew her brother, I, and I knew and I knew her husband. And I, I saw not only what she went through then, but when she went through, when she rewrote the book. And, and it, it, it was my observation. It was, it was an uplifting experience for you to write the book, actually, wasn't it? Was, was it part of the release? Yeah. Part of, yeah. It's mm -hmm. a great read. It's, um, it's, it's a book I highly recommend. It's, I, I enjoyed it much more than I, than I expected. Quite frankly, having a, having a friend write a book, I didn't, uh, you know, normally you're kind of gracious and say, nice book. This is a really good book, Rosemary, and you've done a fabulous job, and I, can, I congratulate you. Thank it's, you very much, Wayne, and thank you for, for, um, for, for being the moderator today. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, I really appreciate it. I really appreciate the support. Um, it's been quite fun. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody for coming. It's, uh, it's a great book. I suggest to all of you, you get it and read it. And I hope that it, it turns out to be the inspiration. In fact, I don't hope, I know it will be inspirational to a lot of people. So enjoy the debate for those of you who are going to go to that. And if anybody has any further questions, you all have Rosemary's email address. You can email her directly and, and she'll get back to you. So Thank thanks you, for everybody. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.